Добрый день. Good afternoon. Today, the results of the general shareholders meeting are going to be finalized with the uh, forwarding of uh, information. Um, unless, I mean, as long as it's not released, let me comment that 11 members of the board have been able to collect the necessary number of votes. Igor Zubkov, Alexey Miller, Vladimir Malov, Alexander Novak, Viktor Martinov, Denis Mantorov, Timur Polibayev, Andrei Akimov, Dmitry Patrushev, Mikhail Serida, Vitaly Markelov. This is the new composition of the Board of Directors of Gazprom, which have just held its first meeting and elected as the chairman of the board, Viktor Zubkov. I suppose that the first question should be addressed to Igor Alexeyevich. Everybody is aware of the amount of ten attention that he pays to the development of the gas motor fuels, and we know that we've got a question from the audience, from Oleg Goncherenko. Oleg Goncherenko, a Belgorod region, and my newspaper is Belgorod Pravda. Viktor Anatolievich. A beneficial and stable gasification of our region until recently uh, hasn't raised any issues, but thanks to you with an emergence of the gas motor fuels as a topic, indeed, very strong interest in quite a few questions um, appeared. And we're talking about a pilot project about an accelerated development of the gas motor fuel market in Belgrade and Rostov regions. A whole mass of questions, uh, for example, about the development of infrastructure. Is Gazprom planning to invest in the construction of the compressor fueling stations in the region? And overall, the question is about the results of the pilot project status right now and what kind of future one should expect. Thank you. Thank you for your question. It is true that both in Mr. Miller's report, it was noted that Gazprom runs a big pool of vehicles, more than 30,000 units, and more than half, 52 of them have been converted to gas. Why? Cheaper and environmentally friendly. More than 100,000 tons of emissions over these years have been not emitted into the environment. In the Russian gas motor fuels, there is a real interest that is expected. I would say that is, is almost like a pivoting point that many regions, and specifically businesses, would like to start building the fueling network so as to convert their transportation to consuming natural gas. Gazprom currently operates in the 17 Russian regions, and last year a decision was made to additionally organize this kind of work in two more regions. And the fact that you've raised the question specifically in the regions of Rostov and Belgorod, we did pilot projects about fast development, fast track development of the gas motor fuels markets. Why we specifically decided to go into these two regions? Because we wanted through these two regions to demonstrate that not only Gazprom's commitments in developing large scale gas motor fueling networks be developed, but so that the regions themselves could provide the necessary demand through such networks, as well as make sure that there is enough vehicles for that, something that we haven't been managing quite successfully so far. And one should note that in Rostov region, the pool of vehicles utilizing natural gas should grow over the next three years to 50 5,000 vehicles 
in the Belgorod region, somewhere about to 19,000. Nowadays, in the Rostov region, Gazprom has built and is operating 11 gas fueling stations. Till the end of the year, seven additional ones will be built altogether. There will be 18 of them. In the Belgorod region, we currently operate four gas fueling stations. Till the end of the year, we are planning to build nine new ones. One should say that we are building good quality stations, modern ones, very productive. So, all in all, we believe that in each region we will have soon about 49.50 fueling stations each. Today, certainly, various measures are being undertaken in the legislative area and elsewhere, for example, in the Belgorod region for the uh, gas-powered vehicle owners. The transportation tax has been reduced 50%. In the Rostov region, there is a program of subsidization in order to help people convert their vehicles to gas. On our part, we, Gazprom Gas Motor Fueling Company, has really fixed, which we believe is quite important, the pricing in Belgorod is going to be 16 rubles 40 kopecks per one cubic meters, while in Rostov region, 16 rubles 50 kopecks. We, of course, can imagine that against the backdrop of the pricing for the traditional fuel that we observe daily, this absolutely is beneficial, and we think that in doing these pilots project, one may expect a considerable growth in demand for the vehicles operating on fuel gas. It is certainly important to bring in private funding into it. We, Gazprom, have actively been working with private investors. And over the past several years, we built nine fueling stations. We're currently building 18 projects. And we're looking into the possibility of building, in some foreseeable future, additional 30 stations. So through the example of such pilot projects, we are of the opinion that within the next two to three years, we are in a position to considerably expand the pool of vehicles in these regions that would run on natural gas. Of course, the price is going to be different for those who will uh, be using the gas three times cheaper. And the environmental impact is going to be very beneficial, something that is extremely important for the regions mentioned. Thank you. Mr. Oh, I know that you're supposed to run, or will you stay a little bit longer with us? All right, let's um, give a big hand to Viktor Alexeyevich uh, for his participation in the press conference. You didn't mention that uh, Alex Milia was elected as my deputy. I'm going to mention it right now. Thank you. All right, so Viktor Alexeyevich uh, quite justifiably reminded me that I didn't mention that Alexey Borisovich, during the first meeting of the Board of Directors, was elected as the Deputy Chairman. And so we shall now continue this press conference. Traditionally, the most numerous uh, number of correspondents attending are from the regions, and I should say uh, the most uh, common question that they raise is about gasification. Amongst other things, I am familiar that Olga Korobova from Interfax. Yes, hello, Alexey Borisovich. IF agency from Omsk. The gasification issue is something that we speak about annually. It remains to be quite vital for the regions, but today we are increasingly hearing about something that the regions are not able to sustain their part of the commitment. So it really would be great for all of the gasification expenditures, um, including um, connecting the networks to these 
um, households even apart from the township, there uh, should be something that Gazprom should pay for. So what do you think about it? And how are things generally with the gasification? Thank you. Thank you for the question. This question is not as much as about the expenditures uh, as about the authority and the responsibility. Amongst the municipal authorities, the regional, municipal, and uh, generally the regional authorities in their budgets have a respective line item dedicated to gasification which is pre determined by the authorities, the commitments, and the territories of responsibility for such regions and, respectively, the regions do have the liability to fund the respective gasification line item. This work is organized with a very precise understanding of the role and the commitment of Gazprom on the one hand and the regions on the other. You know that every year, with every region of Russia, Gazprom signs the plans and schedules for reconciliation of all work, where on the part of Gazprom, it is very specifically stated that all of the facilities that we're going to build in a specific year, as well as the amount of financing made available as part of our budgeting, respectively, on the side of the Russian regions, within the frame of such a document, there are all of the facilities also listed that they are supposed to build, and the responsibility to fund them from their budgets. Quite correctly, it is uh, stated that the uh, pace of gasification uh, right now is limited by the way the gasification is being pursued as a project by the region. But we similarly should be aware that this effectively is the commitment on the part of the respective budgets to perform on their budgets. And, of course, the company cannot, should not, and must not fund and act on somebody else's budget. The task of the company is to pay taxes to the regional budgets, federal budgets. Therefore, the question about uh, whether Gazprom can take on such expenditures, I shall emphasize, is the question about the authority and the area of responsibility. And uh, the, because as you basically know, there's a great number of facilities and gasification program with the municipal and the in-household uh, connectivity because it's the construction of the municipal heating boiler facilities. But in as far as the amount of spending is concerned, we are registering that last year a record level on the part of Gazprom was allocated to the program of gas supplies and gasification for the Russian regions, 36.7 billion rubles. Gazprom can increase the funding for this program twofold and even maybe more but I should emphasize that within the system of relationship that we have these days in terms of the commitments and responsibilities and the authority that the participants in these programs do have vested in them, the company may not be in a position to find specific line items that the regional authorities should act on. In as far as the scope is concerned to be able to increase the gasification pace. Yes, of course, Gazprom does have such a resource, but again, I should emphasize this is not about the amount of funding. Thank you very much for the question, but otherwise, one uh, can definitely state that uh, the bigger part, the bigger number of the regions is where we are doing gasification in 66 Russian regions or the 100% uh, on uh, the commitment that we have, or the major part of them, but there is an additional 
maybe 20% of the regions where you observe a certain lagging behind. But what is notable as well, that this lagging behind is something that basically uh, emerges within just one fiscal year because the Russian regions are taking on respective commitments in the beginning of the year while they slip back, as they say, uh, in between every month uh, right in front of our eyes. So we are dedicating capacities, uh, uh, extra capacities when necessary. Well, we don't get off-takers. The off-takers are not ready to take the gas. The boilers are not being built and full, and so on and so forth. But even from the point of view, you know, the fiscal discipline on the part of the regions who are behind, this kind of a fiscal discipline is not about, you know, something that dates back 50 years ago. This is the fiscal discipline of the current fiscal cycle. Thank you. Not all of the gas correspondents have been relocated to St. Petersburg. They have to take the commuter subsun train. So Jenny Sokolova had to come here all the way. So now is your time to raise the question, please. Good afternoon, Alexei Borisovich. I've got a question about consumers, but about the foreign ones. Last year, you were saying that Gazprom has come very close to the level of the annual contractual gas supplies volume today of takers, but this year we do see that the volume of exports is even lower. But maybe so far they have already contacted you to raise the bar just uh, in case of a future necessity. Thank you. Well, you know, um, you're saying just in case of necessity. But uh, if we are to um, consider such a case, then apparently one should be talking about daily gas delivery volumes to the European markets rather than the annual contractual volumes. Let me remind you that the record figure, and you know it, on March 2nd, 2018, Gazprom set an historic record of a daily delivery of gas to the far abroad markets, 713. 0.4 million cubic meters of gas a day. Even with the contracted amounts annually that we currently have, in terms of repeating this record or improving it, we are 100% ready. Now, in as far as the uh, request that we may receive from uh, foreign offtakers, well, in case of the foreign companies, the total level that we have uh, for the supplies is not uh, so much of an interest because they are more interested in having their own annual uh, contract amounts over the past uh, times. One should note that uh, the um, uh, contract to increase the amount of gas supplies to Austria, which was signed last year and this year with uh, uh, Germany just recently during the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, a contract was signed with um, FAO, and there are other proposals uh, which have been provided to do Gazprom, like uh, proposals to enter into contracts uh, for mid and long term periods. Thank you. Let's um, carry forward with the topic of our uh, overseas supplies. Olesia Astahova, please. Good afternoon, Reuters. Olesia Astahova. My question is about the American LNG. Despite an obvious advantage of the Russian gas in the European market, we do observe the growing amount of American LNG supplies. We would like to hear what do you think about the future of the Russian gas in the European market in 2019. Will it grow or will it diminish? As well as what you think about the overall LNG share in the market. Will it grow? Most probably, yes. Thank you. Well, uh, let's talk about our volumes, because let uh, those uh, talk about LNG who make their money in the LNG market, we'll talk about our own volumes. You know that in the second quarter, you know, in the middle of the second quarter, we were disclosing our evaluation of the volume of our exports based on the results of 2019, within the range from 194 to 2004 billion cubic meters of gas. And today, 
we practically have come to the end of the first half year. And uh, today we are coming out with a much more precise forecast, first of all, on the basis of the actual data of the gas supplies uh, during the first half of 2019. And secondly, with the understanding of the current status of things in the market, its environment, and various trends which we have been observing since the start of the year. And juxtaposing upon it the kind of scenarios which we were monitoring over the previous years with an understanding of what the first half year of our deliveries to the European markets uh, should have looked like and the way the second half here may appear. So based on the results of the work we did during first half year, considering the actual environment and the actual trends manifesting themselves in the market today, we are saying that our uh, forecast for the gas supplies in 2019, the pipeline gas from Gazprom to the European and Turkish markets will be in the range from 198.6 billion cubic meters to 201.1 billion cubic meters. As you may note, this is very close to our historic record of 2018. Now, in as far as far as the final figure is concerned, I believe that very soon we'll be able to uh, come back to you with a more precise outlook. I would say it will be somewhere around 200, but I should underscore uh, maybe even more from 192.6 to 201.1. So this figure is uh, something that um, is very much uh, on the top of the day, based on the results of the first half year. Now, in as far as the share is concerned, we last year set on not only an historic record of our gas uh, export supply, 201.9 billion cubic meters, but also grew our share in the market up to 36.8%. With that, one should note that by 5.3 percentage points, we grew this share simply within just three year period. Now, bearing in mind the reality, and the reality is such that the demand for the Russian gas reached a new level, which is about 200 billion cubic meters of gas a year, our share in the market uh, correspondingly stays within the range between 35.5 to 37.5%. Thank you. Let's continue. France Press Agency, Marina Koraneva. Your question, please. Yeah, she's been writing something. If you allow me, two questions, please. Can you please speak up? France Press, um, Marina Koraneva, two questions, if you uh, allow me. First of all, the Turkish stream. So uh, what are the prospects of uh, connecting it uh, with the southern uh, Europe? And uh, the first is not stream two. So when will it be put into operation in view of all those um, difficulties, the permit from Denmark and so on? Well, as for the Turkish stream, yeah, so we uh, set uh, so many uh, records. Uh, one of them is better than the other in terms of speed and the depth of installation of 217 millimeters pipes and uh, you know, um, doing everything ahead of the schedule. So this is the result of work when nobody is interfering with, with what we are doing. The Turkish uh, stream, it, it goes via the Black Sea and it goes from the uh, shores of uh, um, the Black Sea in Russia, Kais Ruskaya, to Kaikai in Turkey. And uh, this is literally uh, because it is called the Turkish uh, stream, so we uh, mean uh, only the um, marine part. 
part of this pipeline it is in Turkey. But of course, um, gas um, a distribution, so it, it is all there already, it is functional, and the completion of the works um, are envisaged at the end of the uh, 2019. And no questions concerning, you know, the timing and the when uh, uh, it will be put into operation in Turkey. So everything uh, in line with the plans. As for Bulgaria and Serbia, Gazprom, we have uh, booked uh, the required um, capacity and you know gas transport operators in these countries they develop the network themselves and uh, they uh, develop their facilities for supplies of this uh, gas and for its transit uh, via bulgaria and through serbia so all the works um, are going on and in Bulgaria the uh, project is supposed to be finished at the end of 2019 the same uh, deadline and Serbia and Hungary signed an agreement uh, on the connection point on the border line between Serbia and Hungary and there's an agreement and currently uh, there are preparation works for connecting to gas uh, transport uh, systems uh, in Serbia and Hungary. And um, the uh, 1st of uh, January of 2020, this will be the first day of supply. And then there was a question about Nord Stream uh, 2, right? Yes. Yeah, Nord Stream 2. As for this pipeline, uh, all the works um, are uh, done in according with the according to the schedule. So there are no deviations and delays. Uh, currently, uh, 1,480 kilometers of pipes, and it is a double line, and the diameter is. Uh, uh, and actually, altogether, it is 60.4 percent of the uh, whole uh, pipeline, and it is a double uh, line, as I said. And uh, it should be noted that the uh, capital expenditures have uh, been financed uh, up to 80 percent. And um, actually, uh, yeah, there's no way back. And um, we have passed uh, that uh, point a long time ago. So this project will be implemented, and currently, I should say that there are no legal possibilities for not uh, allowing this project to continue. So no possibilities to stop it. So the plans which were originally uh, developed, uh, they remain the same and uh, end, uh, the end of uh, 2019. As for the permit uh, from Denmark, you know, it is, um, uh, not uh, a critical thing uh, yet, and uh, it is about 130 kilometers along the Danish uh, territory, and uh, there, uh, you know, the works will be uh, performed uh, a maximum within five weeks. Yeah, as for Denmark, yeah, Lee Fidos uh, from NTV, uh, they have a question about it. Ilya Fidos of NTV. If Denmark, uh, you know, delays uh, the approval of uh, this North uh, Stream construction uh, works, uh, can Gazprom uh, sue um, Denmark for that? You know, right now, right now, exactly at this very minute, the general director of North Stream 2 is uh, in the Denmark uh, power um, agencies having a meeting and it is um, uh, dedicated uh, to um, obtaining this approval from the uh, Danish regulator. And information uh, we uh, currently have says that uh, the dialogue has been quite constructive. So let's wait for the results of this meeting. Let's carry on. One more question about the North Stream um, pipeline, and I know that Ria Novosti, Tiana Kudryshova. Good afternoon, Alexei Borisovich. I also have a question about North Stream. I'm going to ask a question about another issue. 
and uh, it is the uh, gas directive of the European Union. We know that um, uh, they were amended in May, and now there's uh, nine months um, for European countries to implement all these amendments in their national legislations, and actually this means it is the end of February of 2020. And it is clear that this process won't uh, stop the timely completion of construction of North Stream 2. But what about this transition uh, period? Uh, maybe it will be a certain barrier for um, uh, putting this uh, project into operation. So are you in a dialogue with Germany? Uh, maybe they uh, determined a certain you know, time frame for um, including all those uh, amendments into their legislation. And uh, um, uh, do you take any attempts to exclude this project uh, from um, the um, gas directive regulations? And when can you expect them? Thank you very much for this question. The only thing I should say straight away is that this uh, question you know, is not of a practical nature. You were absolutely right when you said that the European Union countries and now have uh, nine months uh, for introducing all these amendments of the gas directive in their um, national legislations um, until uh, those uh, amendments are implemented into the German regulatory framework. It is um, impossible to assess uh, how this might affect a project. So all this will be just, you know, speculation. So let's wait till these amendments are introduced and in the uh, German uh, legis uh, legislation, let's um, analyze how they may affect uh, the project and then we are going to discuss it from the practical point of view. Uh, otherwise, uh, all these amendments and the gas directive, you know, so this is a working situation. Let's move on to the most interesting questions, Ukraine. Olga Tanas from Bloomberg. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Bloomberg Agency. So if the North Stream is not completed in time, and what if you cannot you know, extend uh, the uh, project with uh, Ukraine uh, for gas supply? So what is going to happen uh, starting from the 1st of January and uh, my second question is, uh, can you agree on the Ukrainian proposal to uh, substitute um, the uh, current um, gas supply contract with the gas swap system? Uh, plan B. Right, plan B. It is a, within the context um, of the plan B, uh, some uh, of the uh, managers of Naftogaz Ukraine were speaking about. Well, uh, Naftogaz uh, Ukraine, uh, they were saying we have plan A, plan B, uh, but uh, at the same time, there were only uh, specific individuals who were uh, referring to that, you know. But for every plan B, there's always plan X. I'd like to say that when we um, analyzed um, uh, foreign uh, analytical materials and through communication with um, my international colleagues, yeah, so when we read and when we um, hear, you know, different scenarios, you know, there are so many of them. And uh, they usually begin like you did. What if uh, the uh, North Stream is uh, 2 is not uh, built um, on time? And um, at the same time, if there's no agreement for um, a transit of gas, or if there is a new agreement for a transit of gas, and what if there's no direct um, agreement for a Russian gas supply to Ukraine, or if this contract exists, and what if suddenly the uh, um, uh, Turkish Stream pipeline is not put into operation on time. And you know, there are so many conditions and all these combinations and ifs, you know, there are so many of them. 
And what if it is yes to this question and no to that uh, part of the question? I don't know, we have to pay, uh, we have to draw attention of our international colleagues uh, to the following. You know, I've seen so many materials and there have been so many meetings when this topic was discussed. You know, international analytical specialists, you know, they uh, cover not all possible options. You know, the, uh, never I have uh, seen an option that an uh, stream uh, is uh, completed on time uh, and that uh, before the 31st of December, the new uh, gas transit agreement uh, is signed and a new uh, contract for gas supply from Russia directly and this uh, contract between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, actually, uh, why uh, not considering uh, this um, scenario? And uh, but also, uh, we see that uh, there are no, uh, there's no mentioning of other options as well. So, you know, the number of scenarios and variants is so big. But first of all, we need definitely uh, do everything to reach certain agreements. This is number one. And at the same time, we uh, need uh, to make sure and uh, uh, Gazprom uh, should make sure that in case a certain scenario happens, then we need to fulfill all our obligations uh, to our European uh, consumers. As for the substitution of gas uh, transit uh, to swap, you know, officially, we haven't um, received any uh, formal proposals from the Ukrainian um, side. You know, these are just certain statements in uh, the uh, social media. And again, uh, they are coming from certain individuals from Naftgaz uh, uh, um, in Ukraine. And we don't uh, treat uh, those statements um, in the social media seriously. Okay, so somebody um, wrote uh, something. Okay, uh, substitution of uh, gas uh, transit with swap. But you know, if we read uh, posts and social media, you know, we can read lots of interesting things. For example, there's a proposal uh, to substitute gas uh, with uh, wood. Yeah, so uh, we don't take um, such statements seriously. So what is going to happen in the future? And you said what is going to happen uh, from the 1st of January next year? Well, 1st of January, this is a New Year's uh, celebration. Yeah, so it's a celebration, yeah, we all, um, celebrating New Year, and it means it will be fun because of these celebrations. Right, let's move on. Lud Ludmila Podobedeva, the floor is yours. You uh, said that uh, the um, gas injection into the underground uh, gas storage uh, will increase, uh, but for how long will it be enough? So in order to uh, ensure that uh, consumers get their gas if there's no transit, okay, and how much gas will be removed uh, from the market because you cannot violate your commitment. Uh, right, again, you see, uh, in continuation of the previous question, you know, different scenarios and different options, and okay, so more uh, gas goes into this underground uh, storage facility, and what if this happens? You know, if we speak about 
the vision and understanding that we have uh, now, and this is uh, this is the framework we work within, so, and it is that the northern uh, street, North Stream, will be put into operation in time. And I would like to stress again, even if Denmark doesn't um, provide their permit, it is not a barrier for completion of all the works till the end of the year. And um, putting the uh, pipeline into operation. That is why when you are saying, what if this happens? If North Stream is in place, then everything will be fine. And uh, um, the volume uh, of gas injected into the underground um, storage uh, facility, you know, all consumers uh, will get the amount of gas we are supposed to supply to them in line with the contract. This year, yeah, we have enriched this injection of gas into the underground storage facilities abroad, yes, and uh, it is two point uh, time um, more than within the uh, similar period uh, last year. And the target volume we are going to inject um, into some storage facilities in Europe, not less than 11.4 billion cubic meters. Not less. What does it mean? So if we have a possibility to inject more, bigger volume, then we will do it. So it will be bigger volumes injected, and uh, it will be as uh, much as we can. And um, in fact, uh, in terms of these volumes, 11.4 uh, billion cubic meters, uh, from uh, the point of view of our strategy and our uh, work with um, underground uh, storage facilities in our target markets, there's nothing new. We have always been saying, and uh, this is in line with our goals, and um, we uh, always um, emphasized it, that the um, uh, volumes of uh, gas in underground uh, storage uh, facilities, you know, it is always 5 uh, percent usually from the annual export volume. And if last year it was uh, 201 uh, billion, okay, 5% out of this, yes, so this is the amount, um, this is the volume we are speaking about. So your question uh, in uh, principle, yeah, it is possible uh, in terms of the timing, yeah, for how long this gas can be uh, sufficient. There are so many factors um, which have an impact on this uh, period. Mm, of course, uh, this uh, is, uh, is what is happening at the time of gas withdrawal, right? So, and uh, the uh, daily um, capacity, yes, the higher it is, the daily capacity is higher. Okay, so the underground storage facilities capacity uh, depends on the um, current demand and weather conditions. and the lower the uh, daily uh, uh, load, uh, the um, longer um, the period uh, is. We also uh, should uh, realize that with um, withdrawal of gas uh, from um, these um, uh, storage facilities, uh, the total volume goes down and the uh, daily um, capacity uh, goes down as well. So at the end of this period, at the end of this period, a period of withdrawal of gas, it will be a totally different yeah, parameters and the daily uh, volume withdrawn from this um, a storage facil facility that can be uh, supplied uh, to the market. And uh, we believe that uh, North Stream has been uh, implemented in uh, strict compliance with the work schedule. Thank you, yeah, so we uh, began with plans B, but we uh, also have questions about uh, plan A. Uh, okay, um, Russia 24, please. Alexey Borisovich. Is it on? Yes. Alexey Borisovich, could you please tell us 
Okay, it is already in the end of June, and December is the end of the agreement. When are you going to begin uh, negotiations with um, uh, Ukraine, and um, what conditions might be um, interesting to Gazprom in order to renew uh, this um, agreement um, in 2020? So uh, um, sometimes uh, they say that Gazprom is ready to start uh, from, you know, Tabula Rasa. What about you, uh, Kiev? Are they ready for that? Well, first of all, I believe that I have to reiterate what is that, um, you know, Tabula Rasa or this uh, new page. A new page uh, means it is a reinstatement of the balance of uh, commercial interests of both Russia and Ukraine. That balance uh, was um, actually damaged by the uh, Stockholm arbitration uh, decision. Is, you, uh, is Kiev ready for this? I believe uh, that um, uh, the uh, I, I believe that um, this uh, possibility is uh, over zero point. It is more than that. And uh, when Gazprom is ready to begin these uh, negotiations, you know that currently Ukraine is uh, preparing uh, for um, their parliament elections, and uh, after that uh, they're going to uh, form the new government of Ukraine, and probably um, uh, and until then, uh, we cannot expect any you know, formal negotiations. So uh, everything is uh, um, uh, moved uh, to the time when we have a new government in Ukraine. And uh, I would like to say you mentioned the conditions. Uh, what um, conditions uh, might be um, for Gazprom uh, for signing this agreement for transit. You know, there's a very important point here. Everybody uh, keeps saying, OK, this gas transit agreement, what is going to happen? When are you going to begin negotiations? What will be the terms and conditions? Uh, what um, legislation and so on? But actually, the main and the key number one question is the uh, question of direct um, supplies of Russian gas to the Ukrainian market. And depending on this uh, question, a, a lot uh, might you know, change. So if a Ukraine says no, then, then uh, on behalf of the Russian uh, Federation, so on the, on the border on the side of the Russian Federation. You know, we are not going to have any you know, obligations uh, for the corresponding um, uh, gas uh, supply um, equipment for uh, providing uh, such uh, volumes of gas. Right now, we do have uh, these uh, gas uh, transport uh, facilities, and within the agreement for gas um, Trans transport, uh, which is effective till the end of this year, we have been supporting uh, those uh, facilities. And uh, it is uh, possible uh, to supply 114 um, in cubic meters of gas per day. And in um, the contract, uh, the uh, total um, uh, volume is 52 billion cubic meters. If the question is no, then um, it should be a different question. Uh, so it won't be just dire uh, direct supplies um, into the um, Ukrainian market. But it will be about uh, gas uh, transport as well, whether uh, we um, need uh, to be um, committed you know, to have um, all um, these um, I guess transport facilities close to the um, uh, border with Ukraine. So Ukraine needs to think, first of all, not about gas transit, but they need to think about their own gas supply. And the answer uh, to the question about gas supply, this is also the 
answer about uh, possibilities of the reverse um, gas uh, transit. And uh, now, um, with all these uh, commitments, or the lack of uh, commitments in terms of this uh, gas supply uh, facilities on the border um, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, yeah, so we can get a clear picture only. We have a clear vision whether it will be possible uh, to send uh, this uh, gas uh, back from Europe uh, to Ukraine, or this possibility will diminish significantly, or maybe there won't be this possibility at all. Next, the uh, question about um, gas uh, supply under the direct, direct gas supply uh, to Ukraine. This is uh, also a question uh, about the price uh, level of gas for um, uh, Ukrainian uh, cons consumers. And Ukraine uh, needs uh, to uh, determine for itself what will be the price um, of gas for uh, their domestic consumers. Russian gas supplied um, backwards uh, from uh, Europe and we all know that uh, it will be much higher than direct uh, supply of gas from Russia. So again, this is an open uh, question and uh, um, there should be a, a clear answer to that. If the Ukrainian uh, side is interested in signing a new agreement for direct supplies of gas, then the um, prices for uh, uh, Ukrainian consumers, then the price will be 25% lower. So when uh, they uh, speak, and when they ask us when you're going to, dis uh, to begin these negotiations on uh, transit, and when are you going to define the volumes, and under what law you're going to, Assign this agreement, you know, so it is uh, putting uh, the cart before the horse. And in terms of uh, the um, law, and, uh, the, uh, and I'm speaking about transit um, agreement um, law, you asked us about our terms and conditions. Well, the uh, terms um, are pretty straightforward. Ukraine till the end of the year and until uh, the end um, of uh, this, till expiry date of this contract. Ukraine won't be able to sign a new contract for gas uh, transit under the European Union law. And uh, this, uh, this train has uh, been long gone. So this train uh, you know, we can just see the back of this train uh, in the distance. So we are ready uh, to uh, prolong this um, contract for transit. And there's one more, one more aspect. This agreement should be economically advisable for the Russian party. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, there's one more question. <coughs> Again, this is a question about extending the gas contracts, but only this time with the Belarusian side. In 2019, the currently effective contract ex expires. Are there any negotiations underway with Minsk? And how close are the negotiators to agreeing upon new terms and conditions for the supplies in 2025. Uh, it's a very good set of questions, and so these are the questions to extend on what if and what may happen on January 21st, January, uh, January 1st. You know that we have so far received first offers from the Belarusian side. We are looking into them, but the negotiations so far haven't yet started. Thank you. Oh, well, let's do the China questions. Uh, Oleg Govorchenko, State Television Altai. Yes, 
uh, in China is the one that you already started negotiations with. Interesting to find out about the future of the trunk pipeline when the name of Altai towards the end of 2014 between Gazprom and the CNPC in China. An agreement was entered into about the supplies of gas along the so-called Western Route. It was about the supplies of 30 billion cubic meters of gas through the pipeline from Yamal, Minetsk district through Altai region. For quite some time, there haven't been any news. Has anything changed? What uh, is the current status of these negotiations and these agreements? And uh, will this project come true within any foreseeable future? You know, with respect to the name of it, uh, and uh, there's a proposal not to call this project Altai, but the Power of Siberia too. But this is something that we still yet have to discuss about how to uh, give it a better name. You know, we run various competitions and we're listening to the regional representatives and the people who live in the regions. In 2014, we uh, signed uh, the main uh, terms and conditions about the supplies of gas, but I would like to draw your attention to that the uh, majority of the uh, points in the contract are binding because we have defined the time frame of the contract, 30 years, volumes, which is 30 billion cubic meters as well as the schedule of supplies and so on and so forth. So effectively, there is only one point missing, which is pricing. So when together with our Chinese comrades, we will agree on the price, then respectively, we would immediately launch this uh, pipeline into construction. Well, hopefully, we will finish just one mega project, which is the power of Siberia. And I believe that the negotiations that we have about this project will become more agile. Now, in terms of the overall future of the project, it doesn't have any alternative because just one little consideration. You know that the power of Siberia, it is uh, a big, large-scale mega project, which for many, many decades to come have the necessary resource base underneath them. But please note, in terms of big major individual fields such as China and Kovicta. But in as far as the Altai project or the Power Siberia 2 is concerned, here we are saying that this project doesn't have any specific individual unique major fields of gas which would feed it. And this is not just the center for the gas production this is simply just a gas basin where natural gas will be produced for the consumers in Russia and abroad in the course of more than 100 years. And that makes it so tangibly different from any other possible project because the resource base for this project is a whole gas and so the overall sort of fate of this project doesn't have any alternatives. As soon as we uh, agree on the price, full speed ahead. Uh, next question from Vitaly Sekol of Energy Intelligence. Thank you. Vitaly Sekol from El Energy Intelligence. I got a question not about the exports of gas, but about the acquisition of gas in the Middle East, Asia. Uh, during the past couple of years, Gazprom gradually increases its acquisition of gas from Uzbekistan. This year, it has uh, resumed its uh, purchase of gas in Uzbekistan. How much gas do you intend to buy from the Middle Asia this year in the midterm outlook, uh, considering the fact that the prices in the European market this year are low? Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a very specific question, and the answer is going to be also very specific. This year, we are planning to acquire uh, in the Central Asia a little bit over two, 20 billion. Uh, in 2020, also a little bit over 20 billion. By 2021, we shall wait and see, but I believe that the figure is going to be quite, quite close to this one. Anyone? Thank you. Yes, I've got a second question. It is about your strategy of developing your overseas projects. Do you plan to change this strategy um, in the current um, environment of uh, a changing geopolitical and economic um, space? 
Um, do you still hold exploration and gas production abroad as your priorities? Maybe you're planning to invest more into downstream, into petrochemicals and whatnot. Do you plan to invest into foreign LNG projects? What are the new regions that you plan and considering entering? Well, you know, this is, and as far as our foreign strategy is concerned, in the first place, it is predetermined by us having the biggest amount of reserves in the world, 35.5 trillion cubic meters of gas. And of course, you should understand that this is a very important uh, driver in as far as our foreign strategy is concerned. With that, during 14 years, uh, through exploration, we have been growing our reserves for the amount which is more than our annual output. Effectively, our foreign strategy has changed, and we're not planning to change it because that covers the projects in such areas as South America and Southeast Asia. So no country lot changes we are having in as far as our foreign destinations are concerned in terms of the possible work. Currently, we do exploration and production. You've uh, noted quite justifiably that the LNG projects are brought to that we are not considering. So all in all, at this point in time, we do not see any prerequisites for our strategy to be changed. Now then, let's move on. Heavy Artillery, Alexei Novikov. Good afternoon, Alexei Borisovich. Uh, several months ago, a decision was made uh, to convert your Ustluga, the Baltics projects, into the practical stage of it. So by 2023, Gazprom may have its uh, large displacement LNG fleet in the Baltic, but simultaneously with that, there is another Russian project that plans to come on stream, which is Arctic LNG2, which almost within a period of time will enter into the global, including European market. So it, so it happens that the Russian LNG is going to be competing against the Russian LNG. Are you ready for such a competition? And uh, previously, it was mentioned that this project is going to have very high efficiency and the low cost for the production of LNG. Could you please quote approximately uh, the cost per ton? Competition-wise, I would like to tell you right here and now that competition of the Russian gas with the Russian gas is not going to take place. If someone is counting on this, then this someone will have to be disappointed. There's not going to be competition of the Russian gas against the Russian gas as far as the Ustluga project is concerned. And uh, the cost per ton, you know that, um, bearing in mind the stage of the project execution, I'm not going to quote to you any specific figure. However, I should note that the project has the kind of advantages that you cannot argue against. And these advantages are in this project having an integrated operational facilities, integrated infrastructure, integrated cycles for, on the one hand, processing and refining, and on the other hand, for the liquefaction of gas, and so on. Due to this comprehensive integration, the cost is going to be very, very competitive. Arthur Tur Toporkov uh, will uh, keep on discussing the Ustluga topic. Alexey Borisovich, uh, hello, Arthur Toporkov from Vedomosti. Yes, uh, I'm uh, also about Ustluga topic, but a slightly different question without um, really uh, pushing into the gas to gas con competition. The Amur processing plant, five years since the foundation, the global LNG terminal construction practice, four years. At the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, you presented basically the project schedule which calls for the construction of the first train within three some years. First of all, 
What is it that makes you so sure that the project will be speeded up? And how confident you are that it is real to do it within this period of time? Because the last um, project that the Piton project is doing has been delayed for 12 months, and it is not as big as yours. Well, if not about the cost per certain unit of project, but about the certain project costs about the, uh, I mean, processing plant and the uh, LNG terminal, you know, 700 billion is very optimistic. You said a little bit over three years. Let's count it. The end of 2023, 2020, 21, 22, 23, and another six months over the 2019, so four and a half. So the time frame for the project implementation fully fits into everything that you've just described. Four dash five years. I do not see here any discrepancy with the global practices. That is why we're saying that 4.5 years, and we're saying that it's going to be the end of 2023. Now, about uh, the 700 billion rubles, well, you know that uh, in the presentation it said more, more than 700 billion, not 700 billion. If you ask me about the current um, variation, I would say 750. But um, the fact of the matter is that there is uh, the prefeasibility, the working and design documentation, and then the installation assembly, and so on and so forth. And you are a quite experienced person, and I'm sure that you are quite familiar with some of the estimates which may point to a possible adjustment to the originally announced amount of investments. So let us um, speak today that it should be about 750 billion rubles. And keep in our minds that there is a pre-feasibility study, there is this uh, stage of a uh, working in design documentation, and then the stage of actual installation and construction work. And uh, that's when we may expect uh, some kind of an answer to be in our hands. But as far as the time frame is concerned, yes, they're quite tough, but, you know, realistic. Arthur has another question to ask. Well, um, what about uh, the principal approach to major project because in 2000 the company was trying to get rid of its uh, non-core assets including construction company and as of last year effectively uh, the former Stroy Gus Consulting has been merged and acquired by Gus Stroy Prom. So uh, has there anything changed in the stretch of the company? Do you expect any considerable reduction of the average capital spending with respect to major project along with an emergence of a big contractor within your group. Does it mean that you consider that the former course at taking the uh, big EPC contracts uh, and giving them to the outside contractors was erroneous? Uh, and uh, will you be increasing the assets of this particular contractor through acquisition of any additional construction operators. Thank you very much for the question. I may just repeat um, things that you've just mentioned. This business for Gazprom is a non-core one. I shall repeat it again, something that I previously mentioned, that this business is a non-core business for Gazprom, and even the participation which we currently have in the soonest possible time will be reduced. Respectively, Gazprom is not creating a mega contractor. Now, what has changed and what are our new approaches? And these are 
absolutely the ones that are going to be done. Let me draw your attention to the fact that the personnel changes which we have instituted in the company that you are very well aware of, these are specifically aimed at achieving absolutely specific outcomes and specifically in the area that you are talking about, which is establishing an effective mechanism of control over the investment construction cycle. The mechanism of control from the parent company down to each specific operator. And mind you, irrespective of whether it's general contractor, sub-general contractor, sub-sub contractor, down to the very rank and file operator, establishing an effective mechanism. Next, what are the basic uh, issues that emerge here? Average cost, you've mentioned it quite rightly, which will be the subject matter of respective control. But there, there is another question, which is the timely commissioning of a facility into operation within the scheduled time frame. And from the point of view of the specific project economics, it is much more important sometimes to commission the project into operation within very specific schedule and of a lesser importance the other matters because the timeliness in terms of facility becoming operational is the start of the generation of the cash flow. That is why these are the kind of tasks that have been set. The mechanisms is being worked on and will be implemented. And as far as the questions are concerned, again, I am saying that this is a non-core business for Gazprom. Please. Yeah, oh, yes, as far as uh, the turnkey you said. Right. So uh, the turnkey practices we deem to be correct, and therefore, we, in our future work, shall broadly employ the turnkey contracts. Igor Bersikov from the Commerzant newspaper. Well, maybe Alexei Borisovich, to some extent, uh, partially covered your question. Yes, Alexei Borisovich, good afternoon. You possibly started answering my question, which is as follows. This year, we all became witnesses to very big changes in Gazprom, I guess. The most serious over the past few years. Could you possibly identify possible reasons which led to the decision about such changes? This is the first part of my question. And the second part, can we consider that these series of changes are over, or should we expect any other important announcements. Well then, um, I'd like to uh, say it right here and now that these changes are not yet over and we shall continue them in the very immediate future. Now speaking about the goals uh, from Mr. Toporskov's questions, uh, we um, basically uh, have derived one of the objectives to uh, set up an effective mechanisms uh, for control over the investment construction cycle. And um, so the kind of objectives that we are facing are very important. Overall, these changes are aimed at overcoming, and listen to me attentively, the inertia as the obstacle in the development of the company. the inertia as an obstacle on the way of developing a company. So we are facing the task to improve the transparency of the company, and we know how we're going to go about it, and we are already doing it. This is a gradual 
implementation of tax monitoring, both for the parent company as well as for its subsidiaries. The tax monitoring. Everybody is going to be absolutely transparent. Next, one should not forget about a systemic efficiency and the improvement of such for Gazprom as a vertically integrated entity. And here, we are saying it, one should pay greater attention to setting the goals and objectives and controlling and monitoring the financial performance from the parent company, again, mind you, down to the investment targets. And you know that the company has them quite a few. And that is basically the core reasons, once again, I should underscore, this is the kind of work that we are going to continue. Nobody asked a question about uh, the shares. Mr. Novikov, I'm sure, has a question about it. Alexey Berisovich, um, um, several times during the general shareholder meetings, we were talking about the 6.6 .6 share of stock, which is uh, on the books of uh, the group of the companies. Uh, clearly, over the past few months, it has really uh, gained in value. Um, still, Gazprom remains undervalued. But again, I would like to ask you a question about your vision and as to how one can dispose of this particular stock, well, understandably, for the purposes for which uh, they have been deposited. Um, 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 <laughs> these are the kind of objections that Gazprom is no longer facing because uh, neither to sell them uh, nor to uh, uh, to uh, place any convertibles under them doesn't make any sense because Gazprom is uh, in a position to really raise money without any collateralization uh, without it. But on the other hand, to be able to raise through this particular stock some sort of a partner or an ally or to uh, really you know, pay them off because we saw in the previous season that some of the Russian companies for the purpose of creating an additional benefit for their shareholders uh, use such practices. All right, I think that we should wrap up this press conference uh, with this particular question. You know that, indeed, in the course of our previous meetings, uh, on more than one occasion, a question was raised about the quasi-treasury stock of Gazprom. And apparently, in the current period of time, this issue is extremely vital compared to when we mentioned it previously. And the reason here is, of course, in the fact that today Gazprom is the leader of the Russian stock market. This is first thing. Second, the quasi-treasury share of stock is not a little one. I mean, for the market, it is not a little one. 6.64%. A little bit more than that, to be more precise. But in this um, audience, one should not explain what does it mean overall for the market. Well, of course, the issue of you know, managing one's own capital and the effectiveness of such practice is one of the most if important issues for the executives of the company, but take into account the fact that uh, we are the leaders of the Russian stock market today. Undoubtedly, this question currently is being very specifically scrutinized. The analysis is being done. Well, you mentioned an, an, an ally, or what was the way you phrased it, uh, an ally? Why, what was it? A partner and an ally. But nonetheless, uh, you are talking, are we not considering the possible sale of this uh, share of stock to some kind of an ally? Well, you see, I would, for one, would say that we are looking into different market 
based options to monetize this quasi treasury share stock. Dear colleagues, we have been working now considerably more than one hour, so I suggest that we should wrap up with that and you should start your lunch. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for attending this press conference. As we used to say in Gazprom, thanks everybody, keep on doing our work. Let's keep on doing our work.